excited to be bringing you today's Culture of Research and Education webinar called Best Practices for Presenting Doctoral Research Results. The core webinar series is designed to provide faculty, students, and alumni an opportunity to share their research and scholarship with the Trident community. By fostering a culture of professional development and idea exchange, participants will have access to a valuable form for lifelong learning. This university-wide effort is coordinated by Trident Doctoral Studies Directors. Uh, just a couple notes before we begin today's session. You're welcome to ask questions at any time, share your experiences with today's subject matter, whether, whether you're a student, alumni, staff, or faculty. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation today. And if you have a question, you can find the question box, the spot where you submit your question or comment about halfway down the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and we'll communicate with you that way. Please don't raise your hand. We're not able to communicate with you that way. And this webinar will be recorded and all attendees will receive a link to the webinar and copy of the slides by early next week. And now let me introduce today's presenters. First, we have Dr. Indira Guzman, who's Doctoral Studies Director in the Glen R. Jones College of Business Administration and a Professor of IT Management. She's been a faculty member and dissertation mentor at Trident since 2006. Her research has been published in over 50 academic outlets. Uh, next, with Dr. Christopher Linsky, who's a Professor of Doctoral Studies for Trident's DBA program. He completed his doctorate in business management and postdoctoral studies in higher education leadership at Colorado Tech University. He's a retired member of the U.S. Armed Forces. He's owned a, owned a management consulting business and nonprofit organization. And outside of Trident, he serves as state surgeon of Colorado for the veterans of foreign wars. And last and definitely not least, we have Dr. Kenneth Cromer full-time faculty member at Trident and military veteran serving for 31 years. Following his career in the armed forces, he served as a senior director and regional emergency services manager in the American Red Cross, a recipient of the President's Volunteer Service Award for his commitment to strengthen our nation and communities through volunteer service. He currently resides in Florida and is active in humanitarian activities. Dr. Cromer is on an alum of Trident's PhD in Business Administration and Master of Arts in Education programs. Welcome everyone, and I'm gonna hand things off to Dr. Guzman to get the presentation started. The floor is yours. I'm trouble hearing you, Dr. Guzman. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you everyone who joined us in the webinar today. The webinar uh, best practices for presenting uh, results of doctoral research uh, studies or dissertations is very important because it's a way for students to uh, discuss and present what they have done in what they have collected data and it is um, it's one of the requirements right in any doctoral program uh, typically it has five chapters and chapters four and five uh, present the results and findings and the conclusions recommendations and implications in the webinar today we're going to discuss uh, the typical structure of those two chapters and give you some advice on best practices with an emphasis on the um, doctoral programs in the College of Business. Uh, this topic is important because it's the opportunity that the students have to report their findings, to report what they have done, and um, follow also uh, always following the program requirements where uh, they are studying. The next slide, please. 
Okay, so in order to uh, discuss this important topic, uh, we want to clarify that in this webinar, we are taking the approach of the College of Business. We have two programs, two doctoral programs in the College of Business, and one is the PhD in Business Administration, and the other is the Doctor of Business Administration, the DBA program. Uh, so uh, we discussed these differences before in, in other uh, webinars, but um, we do it again here just to give you a context because again it's important to see where we are and what uh, kind of expectations you have depending on the program where you are specifically in the phd program in business administration our um, uh, outcomes are a dissertation we call it a dissertation in the dba program we call it a doctoral study project a dsp it has the five chapter structure both of them but the DBA requires an executive summary, which is part of the document. The PhD uh, has a focus on theory and uh, traditional scientific research versus the DBA is applied research and a focus on practice. In the PhD, we have a quantitative or mixed studies uh, and the most common is the use of a structural equation modeling. So today we're gonna look at some of the examples of presentation of results of quantitative studies. In the DBA, we have a qualitative approach mostly. Few students have some uh, use mixed methods with very few quantitative components, but the most common is a case study. And again, in this um, webinar, we are going to provide some examples of presentation of the results of a case study. In terms of the number of uh, uh, the sample size, in the PhD, uh, our students require a minimum of 200 observations of that kind of sample size and also explain G power, whereas in the DBA, uh, the minimum expectations for the DBA program is 15 observations, but at least three data sources. So uh, again, the examples are going to show some of those um, type of um, results obtained uh, uh, by doctoral students. Uh, we discuss uh, in the PhD, we discuss generalizability. So uh, even when you present the results, you are expected to discuss how you can generalize those findings. And that's why statistics are very important because you will present, uh, you will discuss the significance of the results. Whereas in the DBA, we talk about it's a very particularistic approach and we are not expected to discuss generalizability. And instead, we are uh, providing an understanding of a specific situation in a specific setting. And the, uh, the problem in the PhD is a theoretical gap. In the DBA, is a business problem um, issue uh, that is uh, being uh, studied. So um, with these differences and also the emphasis on um, adding, uh, expanding a theory in the PhD versus using theories applied existing theories that we do in the DBA um, and the type of literature using academic uh, literature, uh, scholarly articles in both programs, but the emphasis on the practitioner side in the DBA. We are going to uh, discuss today again how we present those results. So let's go to the next slide and see the typical structure of a dissertation or doctoral study. Again, knowing the difference between those two programs, we start from that point and now let's look at the structure of a doctoral study project. The typical structure has five chapters. The first three are called the proposal. That's chapter one, two and three. The introduction, the literature review methodology. I always say that the literature review is the most difficult chapter and the one that has to be the, the, the strongest one because it has the theoretical foundation right and it has all the background information so those three are very important and after uh, the proposal is approved students collect data uh, it, since all our st uh, studies and dissertations are empirical that means that you need data uh, to um, either test your hypothesis on the quantitative side or um, analyze uh, and study the uh, the context uh, given a case study in the DBA side. So that's going to happen after you defend the three chapters. And the full dissertation includes chapters four and five, which, as I said before, are the focus of today's webinar. We are going to emphasize on those two chapters, chapters four and five, uh, where we present the results and conclusions. So 
let's go to uh, what we mean by chapter four first and then chapter five. So the purpose of chapter four. Now you collected all your data as a doctoral student, you completed your first three chapters, and now it's time to report those findings. It's time to let the world know what you have done. And it's very important to be scientific and systematic. First of all, um, it's uh, very useful to use tables and figures, and you will see that every dissertation or doctoral study has those uh, tools. And uh, they have to follow a certain structure, right, in terms of uh, using uh, the, uh, the formatting as well, but also uh, using those tools uh, with a purpose. So it's important to, for example, the tables, the tables uh, will display all the numerical data. Uh, a typical PhD dissertation will have more tables versus a, a DBA will have fewer ones. But uh, you see, they have to be uh, relevant. They really have to show and, and use a scientific approach and be very systematic in terms of uh, formatting. Um, another important um, aspect of uh, starting this uh, chapter four, where we start showing, uh, where we show the results, is that um, the researcher needs to be very objective and present the results uh, free from author bias. And, and that is what we mean by being very scientific. You know, scientifically, you present the results exactly what you obtain without bias, adding or changing uh, content and um, use this uh, systematic approach. Let's go to the next, yeah. Now, this uh, word, and we talk about alignment uh, before when we discuss uh, how to formulate research questions. And uh, when we go to the next phase and present results and throughout the entire dissertation or doctoral study, really alignment is very important. All the different pieces of a doctoral project should be aligned. So you had a very specific research question and that was a, a good literature review that served as a, as a foundation for your research design. You know, all those components need to be aligned. Similarly, when we get to the final chapter, uh, chapters four and five, we are also looking for alignment. Follow, uh, first of all, um, uh, as, as I always uh, discuss uh, in, in terms of cooking, right? And, in chapter four, you are following your recipe, the recipe that you discussed in chapter three. In chapter three, you discuss how you're gonna analyze data, how you're gonna collect data, uh, and what kind of methods and, and, and tools you're gonna use to analyze your data. So now in chapter four, you very much follow that recipe. You know, you follow what you said you will do in chapter three. Many times we say that the proposal is a contract. It's a contract because when you defend your proposal, you and your committee agree on what it's going to be expected to finish your dissertation or doctoral study. So whatever we agreed, so for example, we agreed that we're going to collect uh, um, 200, we're going to have a sample size of 200. I, I agree that I'm going to test five hypotheses. I agree that I'm going to use uh, this uh, tool and I agree that I'm going to test this model. You know, you, you agree on something. That's like a contract. The proposal is like a contract. So after that, you follow what you agree. You follow the contract. Now, in many cases, maybe uh, you may want to conduct an ad hoc um, uh, analysis or add information, but you have to say that. You see, you're not required to do more or less than what you agreed on. So this uh, alignment is important because you are being consistent with what you proposed in the previous chapters, and now you are following that uh, recipe, that prescription, step by step. The, at the beginning, it's going to be understanding your data. It's the first step. And follow that uh, systematic scientific uh, proposed method, right? Whatever you propose, if you said you're going to conduct, um, uh, analyze uh, analyze your, your data uh, using one specific method, uh, then in your chapter four, that's what you do. So it's exactly whatever method you propose and you discussed in chapter three, uh, follow those. And um, very important to keep in mind that when you are discussing and that, um, writing your results, you have to document every step in a way that 
you are uh, the what you're writing is really like a a document that can be a study that can be replicated in the future. So th those steps is, is very important to document exactly what you are doing, uh, keeping that in mind. Now, transition paragraphs are uh, important, and I and I wanted to emphasize on that because sometimes we think, okay, how am I going to start writing? So it's important to have this structure, and in many uh, programs, as in our programs, we have a handbook and a template. So you pretty much that gives you a high level structure. And after that, you adopt that structure and you um, adapt it to your context, right? What additional subheadings I need. And then uh, using this introductory transition paragraphs is important because that would, will guide the reader. Remember, you are writing for somebody else who will have access to your document. And this audience are uh, other researchers, most likely, and people who are interested in that topic, right? So they are not with you. Remember that your document needs to stand on its own, right? You're not there to guide the reader. You're not going to be there to clarify things. So you want to write the document in a way that uh, it's uh, it's independent and it's going to be understood by anybody who takes the document. So thinking that is, okay, transition paragraphs are important because they're going to lead the reader. You know, in this section, we are going to present the data cleansing. In this section, we're going to present uh, the, the data analysis that was conducted. In this section, you know, you, you tell the reader what you're going to do in each section and why you are transitioning from one step to the next one. So transition paragraphs are important. The introduction is, is important also to guide the reader. You know, if you have that in mind, uh, it's easy to write, having that outline and then uh, having that uh, transition. Uh, some repetitions are okay. You know, sometimes you think, I already said that, you know, why do, should I repeat, should I not? Well, that's one of the characteristics of doctoral work sometimes repetitions are needed. Of course, not too much. You don't want to repeat everything all the time. But uh, repeating the, the purpose of your study or uh, the main um, uh, data set where it's coming from, that is very common. Even doctor, even um, journal articles do that. You know, some repetition is OK. And that's important to remember. Not all the time, as I said, but uh, that guides the reader. You know, remember, it's for the reader to be able to follow what you've done. Demographic description of participants, that's going to go first. It's important to give the reader a context, kind of like what we're trying to do here. I mean, we started uh, talking about what exactly we're talking about. We are uh, we are looking at the doctoral programs in the College of Business. We're looking at the uh, dissertation or doctoral study project. And we're looking at the, both the last two chapters. So uh, guiding the, the process and giving a context to the reader is also important. Uh, use uh, narrative descriptions to tell the story of your findings. Sometimes we think, you know, I have a table, I have the data, but again, you don't, you are not there to tell the reader what your table is for or what the figure is for. That's why the narrative is important. Figure one tells, shows this, describes that, you know, it's, it's tell the reader. Um, in a way, again, the tables, figures should be clear, concise, and easy to read. It's important to wear the heart of the reader, what exactly you're trying to show and how this is, uh, why it's there, you know, the, the usability as well. And, and the narratives are going to be important. And finally, just uh, following that um, kind of approach, you have an introduction for each section and you also have a little concluding, concluding paragraph that summarizes the key findings and summarizes key aspects of each section. So that, uh, that in terms of uh, um, presenting the results. In, in your presentation of results, uh, planning is important. As I said, using the template or handbook of your program uh, is the first step, but then you always customize it, right? I mean, every template that we develop is provides a general structure, but it always has to be adapted. Every study, every doctoral work is unique. No matter, uh, you know, even though we are in the same program and maybe it has a similar topic, each project is going to be different. It has its own 
uh, particularities, you know, its own characteristics, purpose, and, and so on. And especially, it has your own touch. You know, it is the work that you have been doing. Uh, so it has to have your own touch, and we expect that, and that's the beauty, you know, of having uh, different uh, types of uh, projects and topics by our uh, doctoral students. So as uh, remember, you own your product, you own your document, it's your baby, and you have a structure to follow, but you have to adapt it to your study. So when you uh, look at the uh, guidelines, you think, okay, what is going to be um, useful for my case, right? Uh, which tables should I have, which figures, uh, and create them before before you do the actual writing, because remember that the writing and narrative is going to describe what you have there. Uh, the presentation of findings depends on the nature of your research, and, and that's why we're going to look at both angles today, the quantitative and the qualitative. And I uh, just want to remind everyone to always follow the expectations of your program, you know, if you are depending on what program you are. and um, uh, in, in many cases, using the structure of, uh, in terms of um, how to answer the um, research questions is a good way to go. Because remember, you started with your research questions and now we want the, uh, to answer them. So that's one way, you know, first address the first research question, then the second and so on. So having that structure is important. And um, Clarity, just uh, I, uh, as we said before, uh, you are not there with the reader. The reader will look at your document, and uh, if, if you want uh, the reader to understand what you have done, clarity is important. Um, APA is one way to do that. I mean, it's a really a standard uh, way of presenting results, and we encourage it. It's just like grammar, you know, when you speak a language, you might know the words, but if you don't use grammar, your um, your sentences may have different meanings. So you want to follow some kind of structure. In the same thing with uh, uh, presenting results as researchers, we adopt APA because it's going to give us a, a structured way and an easier way for everybody to understand in, in, uh, what it's written. And that also adds clarity. You know, if you use those formattings and uh, expectations, and, and it cleans up the document and will help uh, with clarity. Um, so, clarity, uh, many times I recommend students read what you wrote uh, um, to, to, to improve clarity. And labels every column, very, every row, and so on, that has to do with that. Let's go to chapter five. Chapter five is the final chapter uh, in, in a traditional structure of a dissertation or doctoral study project. And the purpose is really to explain the readers the meaning of what you have done. So, so what? You know, you, you conducted the study, you collected data, you analyzed, and now so what? Uh, first, um, now you need to be sure that uh, you are very transparent and ethical. You always show uh, the results that you obtained, nothing more, nothing less. It's just what uh, what you have done and explain. Sometimes, uh, you know, we expect something in our research and for some reason it didn't happen. It, it didn't happen the way you expected and that's okay. You know, it's not that, uh, uh, you have to change the document. No, you just have to explain. Remember that it's all about learning. We want to learn from what you have done. And if for some reason something wasn't the way you planned, the document, when you when you write about it, uh, we will learn. So like I expected to collect data this way and that didn't happen because of that. The, the next uh, person who will read your document will learn from that. And they probably adopt a different strategy to uh, overcome that problem. So you want to be very transparent. And many times I tell students, you know, now that you obtained the IRB approval, congratulations, good job. Now it's time for you to start collecting data, but document, document, document. So having a little um, um, journal where you write how things have happened is good because you describe, uh, you, you want to remember what are the things that happened that would explain what went wrong or what went actually um, well, you know, that, that helped. This was actually crucial for the success of my study. Well, then report that as well. 
or this was one of the reasons that, uh, you know, something that I didn't expect or I should have done. Document that in your study. We all learn from that and we want to learn from that. That's building knowledge. Um, and provide the answers to the problem stated in chapter one. You know, in chapter five, uh, it's the last chapter, but remember the whole repetition thing. So this is where you kind of state the problem again to really um, describe again the, the meaning of your findings. The structure of this chapter will depend on how you designed your research, that is the methodology, the different program, and uh, any recommendations of the committee. You, you take those recommendations and uh, always, always begin every big section with those uh, introductory paragraphs, concluding and uh, transition paragraphs that I mentioned before. And then the next slide. This uh, last slide, uh, well, I want to emphasize on that, that little figure, close the loop. When you finish your doctoral study project or dissertation, now you want to close the loop, right? Make sure that uh, you are addressing what you wanted to address as part of your study, and you are using the theory that you are um, that you initially um, formulated, right? You, you want to close that loop, and also um, tell us exactly how you are addressing the problem. You know what? You said that there was a problem at the beginning. You said that you were going to address, that you collected it. Now, how is it you are addressing that problem? And usually this um, chapter has these sections, the summary, again, a little bit of repetition there, uh, where you summarize all that, but then um, an analysis, your thinking about the findings, meaning implications, uh, what kind of theoretical, methodological, and practical implications we have. Um, Separating by uh, theory, methodology, and practice is usually helpful uh, because you can see the different approaches. And one of the most important sections of every research is the section of limitations. In the limitations, that's where you say the things that didn't work the way you would have wanted or the way others would have wanted. You know, it's like, okay, these are some of the things that I did not do. These are the limitations. And it is okay to have limitations. That is actually very crucial. Sometimes in business uh, conversations, we want to um, provide, um, we take a different approach. We don't highlight the limitations. We explain the good characteristics of a product and the good uh, um, the advantages of a strategy and so on. But in a doctoral study project, we actually, uh, the, the more limitations you identify, the better, because that means you are really looking at the problem and at the study that you conducted from all the different angles. So the more limitations you identify as the researcher, not expecting others to identify, you identify it as the researcher, the better. And, and again, similarly, taking the approach of limitations from the three perspectives, from the theoretical, methodological, and practical perspectives, gives you that uh, opportunity. So uh, again, uh, limitations is a very important section of, the, um, of any doctoral work. And finally, the conclusions, you really provide recommendations for future research. And it, it, in many occasions, some um, um, new researchers actually look for um, possible studies uh, when they read that section of dissertations or uh, articles, right? Read the section, what does it say in future research? So these are the things that the researcher didn't do and future research can do. You know, with all the expertise that you acquired conducting your study, collecting data, reading it, you know, that expert approach, that's what you apply when you say, you know, future studies can do that. It also helps the students think about future studies when you think about, um, the, the things that you wish you could do yourself. And, and we have a few students who think, uh, I would like to do this, that, you know, maybe too much. And we tell them that narrow down, you know, first finish your dissertation uh, or uh, doctoral study, finish your dissertation, uh, emphasize your work in this area, and in the future you can conduct and look at these other approaches. So future research, that is the, um, the uh, uh, opportunity to uh, think of uh, future projects 
that you yourself can conduct later on or other researchers. So the, uh, many say, you know, it's not the uh, end of a, a program where you finish your uh, doctoral work. It's uh, just the beginning because after that you can continue. You want to finish your degree first and then continue as a researcher doing other studies. And finally, the concluding remarks that uh, will summarize and, and finish the, the, the document. Remember, always thinking about the reader. And the next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to see the examples uh, that I uh, talk about with Dr. Uh, Cromer in the PhD, talking about the PhDBA program and quantitative research, and then Dr. Linsky talking about uh, qualitative research in the DBA program. Thanks. Okay, we can go and go to the next slide. Okay, and so what we're gonna look at here is chapter four, chapter five, in a PhD dissertation. And so there's each one, as Dr. Guzman mentions, is a little bit different. And so the exactly what's gonna be in it is gonna be guided by what you plan. Um, but there's some things that are kind of general that we see in almost all of them. So I wanna uh, talk about those things. Um, the first thing, as we talked about, and this kind of connects back to the last webinar, um, you develop a research model, and that research model reflects all of the hypotheses that you use to answer your research questions. Uh, you chose your test, test method, maybe regression, maybe structural equation modeling. Um, you picked the one that was appropriate to test all the hypotheses in your model in a way that yields answers to your research questions. Um, and so what we'll look at now is regardless of the test method, there's common specific outcomes that you want to report. So we're gonna take a look at what to report, how you report it, and then look at some examples. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so chapter four, the overarching purpose of chapter four is to test your hypotheses, to test that research model and report the findings of those tests. And you're gonna accomplish that in three broad steps. The first step is you're going to prepare your data for analysis. The second step is you're going to evaluate the measures that you use for your constructs and variables, and then you're going to test your hypotheses. And that's the main things you want to present in chapter four. You go to the next slide. In preparing the data, you're really looking at two things. You want to delete any invalid cases and replace any missing data. An invalid case is one that you can't use in your analysis. Let's say you had a survey and you measured five constructs and you had some participants who only answered the questions about one or two constructs and they left most of the rest of it blank. Well, those are invalid. You can't do anything with it. So what you need to do is delete those cases out of your data set. Um, missing data is another issue. Let's say there was a one variable that had five questions that measured it and somebody answered four but skipped the other one. Well, they have most of the, the answers and if it's reflective measures, they're all measuring the same thing. So in that case where there's not a lot of missing data, less than 15% for the, for the same uh, measure, then what you can do is just replace that missing data with the statistical mean as one way to do it. Another way to do it is to delete the case. So you have to make your choice as to how you're going to handle that missing data. But you need to report in your uh, first section of your chapter four is, is what you did with invalid cases. How did you define an invalid case? What did you do with it? How much missing data did you have? And what did you do with that missing data? And then lastly, how many cases remained for analysis? So if, if, you're, if you needed 200, that's the number that um, we see typically, so you needed 200, maybe you collected 500 cases, but you had to delete 350 of them, well, you only have 150 cases. You might not have enough cases for your analysis, so it's important to report how many cases actually remain. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, the next thing you want to do is evaluate your measures, and so you've, you have this research model and you have variables in it, and each variable is measured in some way. Usually it's by a scale of items or questions. 
And so you want to make sure that that scale you use to measure that variable is valid and that the scale as a whole is reliable. Um, if it's a parametric test method, you also have to verify that the regression assumptions are met, such as normal distribution. Um, and then once you've done those things and you've satisfied yourself that each of your measures are valid and reliable and that your data set is suitable to the test method you're using, then you finalize your measures and you compute your descriptives. And you're going to report the details of that in a narrative form and you're going to support it with appropriate, appropriately formatted tables or figures depending on what test method you use. Um, you don't have to talk about everything that's in the table in the narrative, but you need to talk about the table itself and the key points that are in that table that the reader needs to notice. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, once you've evaluated your, your uh, your your variables and you know that your measures are sound and you've computed your descriptives now you're ready to actually test your hypotheses because now that you're satisfied that the way you measured that variable is is satisfactory now you're ready to look at the relationships between the variables and that's your hypotheses normally it, it depends on how you're what tool you're using but normally you're going to look at your bivariate relationships first and that's where this variable is related to that variable and you're going to look at those first. And then once you look at each of those, now you're going to look at your multivariate relationships, your uh, mediation, moderation, multigroup analysis, if you're doing that, um, and test the broader model. And then lastly, as you go through and you do all those things, you may see things that are different. You may see things that are not what you expected. Um, you may see something that you would like to look at further. So there may be some post hoc analysis that you want to do to test some other things and you report that after you test your hypotheses. Um, and then what, as you do these things, you report the details in narrative form supported by tables and figures. And we'll look for as some examples of those. Let's go to the next slide. Um, in preparing your tables, because most of your reporting is going to be in tables. And so each table, at least at Trident, you want it to be formatted APA 7 guidelines, and we'll look at some of those. Um, each table should display content that you've already introduced and discussed in your narrative. There shouldn't be anything new there. Um, each table should be needed um, as a convenient summary of, of the content that's related to it. There should be a need for a table. You just, you just don't throw a bunch of tables into your document without a need. So each table should serve a, a purpose and you should discuss that purpose. In your tables that you report, you want to report final results in your tables, not the intermediate steps. So let's say that you, in, in your measurement uh, evaluation, you, you decided that maybe two of the questions for one of your variables wasn't, uh, weren't valid and you had to delete those two questions. Well, you won't report those in your table. You'll discuss it in the narrative of, of what you deleted and why you deleted it. But in the table, you only want to give your, your one table with the final status. It's usually easiest if you prepare your table in Excel and then copy and paste it into your document. It's easier to format it and get everything right and make changes to it. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is this is an example of a table that is typically used when you're uh, using factor analysis in a reflective construct um, to show validity and to show your scale reliability. So here you see the name of the first variable and those five items, that's the five questions in that scale, and that's the factor loading for each of those questions. And then the scale reliability, that shows the Cronbox alpha for the scale as a whole. And so what this illustrates is that each of your items is valid and reliable. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, and this is one, if you're using structural equation modeling with PLS mainly, um, it gives you a, a few different looks. And this table shows construct reliability and convergent validity. For your scale reliability, you're looking at how your scale as a whole works. And so Cronbach's alpha and composite reliability, those are measures of that. Your average variance extracted, that's a measure of the convergent validity of your questions, of your items, how they converge together. 
And so you want it to be at least 0.5. The others you want to be at least 0.7. But this is a way that you could display this. I also want you to notice in the um, we have the ta the uh, the table number and then the title of the table that tells what it is, and then your heading across the top, your your uh, your row headings or your your, ta your column headings. You see there's a line above and below that. And then you have all your data, all your rows, and then one line at the end of the table. And that's how you typically do it in APA 7. Let's go to the next slide. OK, this is a, uh, once you've established your validity and reliability, this is how you would display your narratives. So just going across that first row in the table, you'll have the name of the variable, the number of cases that you evaluated, the minimum and maximum uh, uh, responses for that item, the statistical mean of all responses for that variable, um, your standard deviation, and then over at the side here, I have skewness and kurtosis, and those are uh, measures of normality. Um, skewness and kurtosis give you an idea if you have a normal distribution. If you're using a parametric test method, you'll want to report that to, to demonstrate um, that, that you do have normality. So if, you're, if you're using a non-parametric method like um, PLS, you don't need that. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is a, a correlation table. And I wanted to show you this slide to show that um, not just the format of it, but when you initially get this raw table, all the numbers that are in that blank area are just like the numbers in the area that's completed. Because if you have the second variable the relationship with the first variable, that's the same as the first relation, first variable's relationship with the second variable. So what you do is you get rid of all that extra, extra uh, numbers up there and just make them go away. You also don't need to know that a variable is related to itself. So you can do away with that line. And what's left is just the key information, the correlation coefficients, and also your uh, significance, your p-values is illustrated by the, by the asterisks and then at the bottom, you have the legend of what those asterisks mean. And so this is a, a uh, just a basic Pearson correlation table. Let's go to the next slide. This table will be used to report your bivariate relationships when you're testing uh, with linear regression. Um, your, your, you want to have your hypothesis number and state your hypothesis. And then what was your significance, your p-value? And then what was your beta, which tells the strength of the relationship. And then the R squared, which tells how much of the variance in the dependent variable is explained by variance in the independent variable. Now, you'll only have a table like this if you're using linear regression, because if you use using structural equation modeling, you won't have those R squares, because your R square will be for the whole model um, as a system of hypotheses. And then your finding, was it supported or not supported? Now, if we go down to H3 and H4, then you see that I didn't include a beta R and R squared because the, it wasn't statistically significant. So even though I had numbers I could have put in those columns, there's not a significant relationship, so it's really not applicable. So you don't want to give extra information that you don't need. Um, let's go to the next slide. And let's go to the next slide. That's actually a duplicate. I'm not sure how I stuck that in there. Okay. If you're using uh, PLS or, or, or even our AMOS, some form of structural equation modeling, it may be uh, more beneficial to you to use figures instead of tables to report your results. This particular figure is the figure of the measurement model run. And what you see uh, next in the blue squares, you see the question numbers, the item numbers. And that number just next to it, that is the factor analysis for that for that uh, item on the construct. And then the number you see in the construct in, in this um, slide is the AVE, so which tells us the convergent validity of all those um, items. But you can change that. You may want to report the Cronbach's alpha instead of the AVE. It's, it's really up to you which one you report. You just need to be clear in your narrative what you're reporting there. But this way you can see all of your items in the same time. And this um, would replace that first slide I showed you where we reported the factor analysis and reliability. Let's go to the next slide. And this is one where you would report your relationships. You see all the factor loadings. I left those out on this one. 
And now what I have is I have each line is the hypothesis, and then I have the beta, which is the strength of the relationship, and then in parentheses, the p-value, which tells if it's significant or not. And the numbers in the blue circles, those are the R squared, showing how much of the um, variance in the dependent variable is explained by all the other uh, variables with lines pointed toward it, is, is the best way to say it. Um, and so this will be how you would report your structural model instead of the table that we used to show the bivariate analysis. Now, if you're if you're using another form of of um, analysis, so say in your regression, and you don't have a figure like this, you may want to manually create a figure like this to just show all the relationships in your model to give the beta, to give the um, the uh, p value and to give the r squared um, in in a structural equation model like this that first number i said it was a beta but it's actually a path coefficient but you treat it as in the same manner as you would a beta okay let's go to the next slide okay so let's go to chapter five when we were in chapter four what we were doing we were testing our models it was all about hypothesis it was all about findings and the last thing you want to do in chapter four that i didn't mention is you want to um do an evaluation of your findings you want to summarize what did i find that the in chapter five as dr guzman mentioned you're going to close that loop and what you're doing now is you're connecting the dot and you're taking your findings and using them to answer your research questions and to show um, how they apply to your problem statement, how what what is the significance of it, why is it important, and you do that first in implications. You do implications for theory, implications for practice, implication for methods, and basically what you're saying in in those chapters is you're saying, okay, I've got these findings, I've answered my research questions. What does that mean? What's the significance of it? Why is it important? What did I really find? That's what goes on your implications. Your limitations and your delimitations are where you put things that maybe the reader should know that may influence your findings. Let's say you use um, self-report for performance. Well, maybe you should mention that as a limitation that you're that you're 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 running on the assumption that people are going to be honest, but it's self-reported. It could be inflated. Um, a limitation is are things that are that could influence your findings because of the design of your research. Delimitations are things that could influence your research because of decisions you made in your analysis. And that's the difference between limitation and delimitation. Um, and then conclusions, Dr. Guzman uh, covered that pretty well. You want to really stick the, the main points of your research and where does it go from here? What's, what's the future? Um, what is the next step? Let's go to the next slide. So what not to do? There's some things you don't want to do that that is easy to do. One is you don't want to bend your data to your hypotheses. You've, you've got all this investment in developing this research model and you've collected your data and then you run your analysis and it's not coming up the way you expect it to do. There is tempting to keep running it and trying to get it to tell you what you want it to say. Um, but instead of doing that, you really need to try to understand what is it telling you? It might not be what you expect, but it's still important. Some of the, the best things that come out of research are not what you expected to see, it's what you found that was new, that was unexpected. Um, and don't quit too soon. There may be more there than meets the immediate eye. Really look at your at your results and your findings and, and see what's really there. Let it talk to you. In chapter five, don't overreach your results. You need to stay objective in your reporting and only report what you actually found. Um, don't stretch it to say something that maybe isn't really there, but you want it to be there. And so just stay objective and don't overreach your results. Don't overlook your limitations and delimitations. Uh, next slide. I think that's it. And I'll hand off to Chris, to Dr. Linsky. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dr. Cromer. Uh, for the last section, we're gonna go over my favorite part, and that is the DBA qualitative presentation of results. And the benefit for the qualitative portion of presentation is we really only focus on two types of analysis uh, in the DBA program. And those two are, are most common, the descriptive analysis and thematic analysis. 
Descriptive analysis is using some of those numbers. We are describing some statistics relating to the population, uh, traits of those populations, demographics, and sample size. How many people with these traits took each instrument? And that just gives a quick snapshot for your reader to understand who was involved and what part of the study they were involved in. A descriptive analysis cannot be the sole analysis for a qualitative study because it doesn't dig into the narrative. And that's the most important part. Thematic analysis is used for that narrative response as most of your instruments are going to be open-ended, meaning participants have to provide you with text, uh, either text that you are uh, orally being presented with and will often record and transcribe, uh, or physical text on a questionnaire survey that you then, as the researcher, have to be able to interpret. And the biggest difference between quantitative and qualitative presentation is that analysis of using interpretation of the researcher. Interpretation means that the results and findings are going to be subjective to the researcher, their worldviews, uh, and how they uh, took all of the information and categorized it into themes, or the basic constructs or categories of data that lead to a answer to the research question. This can vary by researcher, which is why it's very important to make sure that you use a thematic analysis process that is very structured. The process is varied based on which author you cite, uh, which will determine which step-by-step -step process is necessary. Now, the important part of this for chapter four is again explaining what that process was, how you conducted each step, and then how those steps led you to the codes that then lead you to the themes, which then lead you to the answers to your research questions. I want to go over an example for that. Uh, so next we're going to talk about chapter four in the doctoral study project. And so the expectation is very similar uh, to the uh, PhDBA dissertation, except the broad steps really relate to preparing the data for analysis. Uh, there are times where even in a qualitative uh, instrument, the participant doesn't provide enough data for it to be usable. And so you need to explain if there's any data that is excluded and why it's excluded. Then, of course, conducting the coding and theming using the process that you cite from the literature. And then the interpretation of themes in relation to the research questions. One of the biggest concerns that we have is we may create a list of themes, a list of con uh, content that leads to you know, a lot of concepts within the data, but those concepts don't relate back to the research questions. And so what you may find is that your participants like to talk about different areas that don't really do what you needed it to do doesn't mean that that data is excluded. You actually want to present that information and say, you know, several of my participants, they discussed this additional topic, and that leads me to the potential of future research, uh, or it leads me to understanding a limitation in my instruments. I may have asked the question incorrectly, and therefore the participants started talking about something that I didn't mean for them to talk about. And so I have to be able to uh, separate the themes that are related to my research questions and the themes that may lead to uh, either limitations or future research. And so let's go into an example. Uh, and this example here is uh, provided from one of our uh, recent uh, DSP defense students uh, who successfully defended uh, Melvin Jones. And so I just want to say thank you to Melvin uh, for the use of this uh, information and the quality of his findings. Um, what I wanted to present here was kind of the structured flow of understanding the, the process from start to finish of descriptive analysis through the thematic analysis process. Figure seven listed here, uh, this is the descriptive analysis. 
This provides the three sources of data that was used in the study. It explains the uh, demographics for each of the participants and provides that numeric number of uh, how many people within each subset of the population participated in those three sources of data. And you see it all in a very quick snapshot. The next example is the first step uh, that many qualitative researchers use for coding, and that is a word cloud. The benefit of a word cloud is it simply tells you the number of times a term was repeated within a given document or set of documents, uh, which is for us most often either the questionnaires, interview transcripts, or focus group transcripts, uh, but it also could be your personal notes that you move over into a document um, that can be uh, evaluated using uh, many different types of software to create these word clouds. And so if you look at the word cloud, you can immediately see what are the, some of the specific concepts um, that were explained several times throughout the data. The one important note on cl uh, word clouds is the word cloud does not provide meaning. The word cloud only tells you the number of times or the frequency of those terms being used. Uh, but an example, if you're doing a, a study on recycling, chances are you're going to have a, a really big recycling word in your word cloud, but it doesn't tell you recycling is good, recycling is bad, recycling is important to the environment. Uh, so the context, this only gets you to the very start of the coding process. And so the next example is, is just a template of the table of connecting codes to themes. And so this table here um, shows you just one example and the next uh, example will show a different format of this. But really you're showing the difference uh, or showing the connection of those codes, which are the, the concepts utilized uh, from that word cloud and connecting them together to determine what theme makes sense. And so uh, for the uh, example here, you can't see those very well, uh, but you can look at these in the uh, archive uh, documents uh, if you want to see how the specific terms connect to each other. But really the process is that the researcher has to take these primary codes the major concepts that are repeated throughout the documents and sets of documents and determine how they relate to a similar concept. So if I have five things that can be housed together with an overarching concept, that overarching concept becomes my theme. Taking those themes and relating them back to whether or not they answer the research questions or not, uh, that ultimately uh, determines the findings that we have. And so these are just two examples, one using a table and one using a graphic on how to connect those themes with those codes. And on the next slide, uh, we have an example of now connecting those two. This is something that you have to read along from step to step. How did I code? How did I create those themes? And then I have to explain which theme relates to re each research question. And so it's important that I connect those so that I don't just say the answer is these eight themes. Instead, I have to say research question one was answered by themes one, two, and three. And then I have to explain it. And that's the findings. The findings is how does that theme answer the research question. And so these are all just some examples for chapter four. The next slide will be uh, an expectations for chapter five. And so in chapter five, the OHR overarching purpose is to explain those results and how they can uh, be applied. For the DSP, that's the most important part, uh, is the implications of how does this apply to the theory that we used, 
practice for the organization or field that we're studying and the potential for uh, applying to the methodology that we use and that usually leads to future research. Recommendations to the organization uh, is one of the aspects of the DSP program that is mostly different from the PhDBA, is we really are looking at how can we take the data that we found, analyze it, and then tell the organization or people within a field how to use that data to improve their organizations in some way. And then of course, future research opportunities, you know, what did we miss? or what uh, uh, gaps may still exist similar to our research that we weren't able to do because we needed to focus on one concept. And now we're gonna recommend that future research be done on concepts similar to, but not quite the same as our study. Now the next uh, slide, uh, this is just an example of presenting those recommendations. You really do wanna again, connect it to the finding. So if the research question one was answered by the theme, themes one, two, and three, that created findings number one, I need to make sure that I say that based on finding number one, here's my recommendation. And so it has to be related back to coding, theming, findings, and then uh, recommendations for improvements. Now, our last slide is gonna explain what not to do in uh, the qualitative portion, and that's not to be biased, which is important for all research, um, but because qualitative research incorporates that subjectivity, we really have to make sure that researchers are mitigating bias as much as possible. And there are many ways to do that, such as uh, journaling or bracketing, to where when I say something, think something that's not specific to the data that's given to me, if I write it down, I can separate it mentally when I'm doing my analysis. I know that didn't come from my data. Don't rush. We have to dig deep. Qualitative analysis is about getting down to the phenomenon and understanding what the concepts mean for the person that is telling us something, you're giving us data. Uh, it's not just surface level. And so we have to make sure we take the time to dig into those concepts and really understand, is there hidden meaning behind the words that are being told? In chapter five, we can't generalize, right? Qualitative studies, especially case studies, only relate to the populations being uh, researched. We can say that it might, relates to another organization or to another field. But we always need to recommend that future research be done to see if that data is similar if conducted uh, in a, a different organization. And then again, uh, same with all dissertations and DSPs, don't overreach. You can only report what the data tells you. And if you hoped that it was going to come to something else, that you were gonna have different findings, explain, why there was a discrepancy, if you know what that reason is, but never report that it's going to do more or that you found more than what you really found. And that's all I've got uh, for the qualitative side of the DBA program. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Daniel. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you so much everyone for uh, the great information and your time. Uh, and thank you everyone in the audience for bearing with us as well, because uh, I'm not sure what was going on, but GoToWebinar is really lagging with the screen uh, or with the slides on the screen. And as a reminder, if you have any questions, you can submit them in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. It looks like we're starting to get a few things in already. Uh, so just, yeah, send the questions in and we'll get to them in, in, as they come in. Uh, and first question, this one is for you, Dr. Cromer. Uh, let's see, and I actually have to scan back to the slide uh, that it was in. It was referencing, um, it was referencing the expectations in chapter four, is that specifically related to the PhD program or is there a crossover with uh, DBA? It's, um, it depends on which 
part of it <laughs> we're talking about the exercise chapter four but specifically that's that's the things that we expect out of a quantitative research project um it's a little different it's similar but it's but it's um but those expectations are the things that are expected of a quantitative analysis um which is not exactly the same as a qualitative analysis the expectations are a little bit different um because the nature of the analysis is a little bit different but it, but as uh, Dr. Linsky talked about, the you have the um, you still have to evaluate, prepare your data. You still have to to um, analyze your data. It's just different methods that we're using. Okay, thank you. And then next question, I'll st we'll start with Dr. Linsky on this one. But um, what in do the processes remain the same if we're looking to do mixed methods in our research? Yeah, and that's kind of a two-part answer. Uh, and the reason I say that in the, in the DBA program, our mixed methods, we really try to keep students to using quantitative analysis only in secondary data. And that's because we don't want student staff to go out and validate uh, quantitative instruments just because of the time frame of the program. Now with that note, uh, in a mixed method study, essentially you're going to take everything that Dr. Cromer has explained and everything that I have explained, and you're really gonna have to do both. You're gonna have a quantitative portion, and if you're doing true mixed methods, that means you have to do quantitative analysis. And so depending on which uh, quantitative tests you're going to use uh, that Dr. Cromer went over, uh, will determine how you explain those quantitative findings. And then you have to do the qualitative analysis, and then you have to explain how those two are related or not. It sounds like what you're describing is twice the amount of work. Right? Very often, yes. Okay. So. Great, thank you. And uh, next question, we'll stay with you, Dr. Linsky, because it was just, it, it was about the codes. Uh, you mentioned a few slides back, and that question is, what is the best method to transitioning codes to themes or a suggested process? Yeah, the first process or the first step in the process is to make sure you understand who you're citing. Uh, so there are many different ways of coding and there are different types of codes. Uh, the two most common that we use a priori codes means you have a predetermined list of codes, usually based on your theory, based on your literature, and you're trying to relate those, uh, your findings directly to that theory or to those concepts in your literature. And then the other is emergent codes. Emergent meaning it's just coming straight from the raw data. It's just that replication. Those word clouds are really good for emergent. And so how you, how you go from coding into uh, theming is gonna depend on those two types or other types of codes. And then the rest is subjective. How do you interpret how this code relates to the other codes? Uh, this can take weeks of analysis you can really uh separate out and and do it two or three times and you might come out with different answers each time and so it's about becoming more fluent in the process i recommend uh, practicing take a document that has nothing to do with your study upload it to an analysis software and do some practice coding and see if somebody else would get similar themes that you do and that's a great way to find out uh, if you kind of understand that process well. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, let's see, next question. Uh, this one is, uh, I'm gonna send, actually send this one to Dr. Guzman, because uh, it, it, do, it does reference the her uh, presentation at the beginning. Um, what happens if our proposal is rejected? Uh, 
Dr. Guzman, I think you're on mute right now. I'm sorry, thank you. So this is, um, first of all, as students get to the proposal phase after the chair and the committee members have uh, approved to move to the fence. So they have to give the green light, right? So it's a, it, it just doesn't happen that um, a student don't get, get to the, the fence without having the committee uh, agreed on that, right? So uh, that's the first step. And even um, during the proposal defense, we have different different outcomes. Uh, so it's always, uh, all the students get comments, revisions that they need to address. So it could be revisions that need to be approved by the chair only, revisions that need to be approved by all committee members, uh, including and the chair, or it should be um, revised and um, redefined in a month or uh, need significant restructuring. So th there are uh, different outcomes. They are described in the handbook, uh, but uh, it will depend on the revisions. You know, I always tell students to get a dissertation of doctoral study approved, you need uh, at least three committee members, right? Three committee members in your, com uh, in your um, committee that need to approve. Right, and then um, the, the director approves, and even the final document is approved also by the dean. So it's really um, an, a process that has to do with uh, contributions of of, uh, of knowledge, right? So you are uh, you receive the feedback from your peers, from the people who are you going to be part of that uh, community. So um, doctoral um, researchers, right? are part of the committee and they assess the, the process. So it's really that kind of process. You, um, if, if the committee agrees, you move forward. If you move forward, you will have those revisions, comments, and continues to improve, and they have to provide the final approval. So it, it, that kind of process is described in the handbook again, and there are multiple options. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is for you, uh, Dr. Linsky. Uh, on a few slides back, you talked about uh, digging deep in a qualitative analysis. How do we know when to stop digging and to start moving on to the, what we need for the next chapter? This can be really difficult. Um, the first thing is to understand how much data you have. And so one of the concepts that we didn't go over tonight is saturation of data, which is part of that data collection process. In qualitative, uh, where you start seeing the same concepts over and over, you're not really seeing anything new, any new concepts, but that means you have to kind of dig into the, the data uh, and do some preliminary analysis uh, before you get into the real um, you know, actual analysis steps of coding and theming. And so when you look at the number of data points that you have, uh, so for our program, we have a minimum of 15 participants, at least three sources of data. You start seeing the same things over and over. Once you start seeing the same things in your interview transcripts, right, you keep reviewing them, you keep reviewing them, but you've kind of stopped getting anything new that's when you're done with interview transcripts. So then you'll move on to the second source of data and then the third source of data. And for most of our studies, you're gonna then triangulate to compare uh, how those three sets of data interact with each other, uh, if they have similarities uh, or differences. And then you're just explaining those. Why were they similar? Why were they different? Uh, but it really just comes down to that repetition once you keep getting repetition, nothing new, then you're probably good to move on. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is for you, Dr. Guzman. Uh, how do you recommend uh, from staying away from implied and irrelevant evaluations? Oh, I'm not sure the question. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they are from the researcher. Uh, uh, do, do you need me to repeat the question or do you need clarification on the question? I would like to have clarification, please. 
Okay, yeah, the, the person who sent it in, could you clarify that, uh, please? And then we'll we'll cir we'll circle around to an, uh, another question that just came in that's more general, and we'll get Dr. Cromer back involved. Is that uh, how how do you go about forming and choosing the members of your dissertation committee? Okay, it's um it's really a collaborative effort, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to match um people who have a background that's similar to what you're researching searching so if you're if you're in um if you're dealing in leadership then really you want to make sure you have a, a a committee member that's that's a heavy on leadership if you're going to use structural equation modeling it's good to have at least one committee member that's really good at structural equation modeling and so uh, the purpose of your committee is to guide you um as you complete your research so you really want to kind of have a match there to where you're getting um a committee there's three people you want them each to be contributing a piece of something that you need and then your chair is the one that pulls all that together and the chair is usually a collaboration dr guzman in in our program when a person's coming into their uh, qualification exam where they're presenting what their research is going to be about um she asked the member do you have somebody um who you're who's who you're interested in seeing if they're if they would be your chair and also she's looking for people that she knows maybe would be a good match. And then they participate in that qualification exam as a panel member. And then arising out of that, you know, we select a chair that's a good match and then select committee members that can contribute toward that project. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, just, okay, we got two more questions. A new one that came in and then gonna, you know, sort through the clarifications on that previous question. Uh, and another question for you, Dr. Guzman, at, at what point is it determined that our title is a title that we can pursue or that we have to go into in another direction? Who's the, who's the person who determines this? Uh, the um, dissertation or doctoral study title? I guess that's the question, right? Yeah, I believe that probably title the referring to the research question or you know research subject. Yeah, direction. Well, I, we had situations where the title was even um, revised after the final defense. So it's important uh, to have one title when you start writing your dissertation or doctoral study project to kind of guide you what you want to be known for. Like, you know, I am the person who wants to be known in the area of cybersecurity. Well, the, your title should have cybersecurity. So um, uh, I would say start from the beginning with a title, but it, uh, as everything in a, in a dissertation uh, or doctoral work is a process. So at the end, when you're done, um, you want to make some adjustments. For example, some of the uh, common adjustments is uh, to include also the context, what kind of uh, context you conducted the study or what were the, was the major finding. Uh, uh, sometimes our studies include like, you know, like the, the, the aha finding that you had in your study as part of your title. Again, it's what you want to be known. It's just like, um, finding the title of the book, because that's what a, a dissertation or doctoral uh, work or doctoral study is, you know, it's a manuscript that is gonna be published. So uh, that title is, uh, th that choice is important. And, uh, I, and I appreciate the question because again, it's uh, something that um, it is a process and it's gonna be what you will be known for. Okay. Thank you. And then the last question again for you, Dr. Guzman, let's see if we got everything we need here. And I believe I have the correct slide up on the screen that the, uh, that the attendee is referring to. And it's, um, and it, again, the question, how do you recommend staying away from implied and irrelevant evaluations in the scientific writing for chapter five when explaining the findings? uh irrelevant and uh, what was the other word sorry uh, sure uh, hold on one second uh ir irrelevant and implied uh, 
um, well, I, I in in like in every process and even in the journal publication process, you receive uh, evaluations and feedback, and um, but you are the owner of your manuscript, of your research, of your doctoral work. So the um, the qualification of irrelevant implied it's it's really uh, another opportunity for you to assess what what you have done and reply to that. I mean, I um, sometimes you if you think that you um, whatever feedback uh, evaluation is irrelevant, you need to um, justify that, and and that's why we use the literature for everything or your data, and that has to do with being scientific, right? It, it's really a, a collegial process where you defend your arguments with evidence. Whatever you think, you know, I shouldn't go this path or I don't agree with this uh, comment or with this recommendation, why? Well, because I have this, I have the literature that supports, I have the data that supports. And that's what we mean when we say be scientific. Okay. Okay, thank you. And so the person asked that if you need further clarification, we'll be happy to circle back with you after the webinar. And I have a couple more questions, and we'll address those afterwards since it is get, getting late, especially for those of us on the East Coast. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for attending today and just um, and really ex extend everyone's thanks because this has been one of the most popular core webinars we've ever had so you know thank you for your continued support uh, for this uh, up down the page you can see the core web page which you can visit this uh the find some of the previous uh some of the previous webinars and and for those of you who asked, the slide deck and the recording will be sent out by early next week. Uh, new thing that we are we just started doing is that on Alumni Fire, we created core webinars group. So if you have if you watch if you watch the recording of this later, you have any questions, feel free to go here, ask questions. And myself or you know Kendra Temple, who's our director of alumni engagement, will make sure that one of our panelists addresses those qu uh, questions for you. Uh, again, special thanks to Dr. Linsky, Dr. Cromer, and Dr. Guzman. Thank you to all those who attended for your participation, interest, and great questions. Let's continue collaborating and building knowledge. If you'd like to reach out to us, contact information is on the screen now. Goodbye and have a have a great evening. Thanks so much. Thank you.